cheat. <laughs> this is survey the room. Who prefers astronomy over biology? I like both. Yeah. So we'll stick with folding. I think they've given up on their podcast. Because <laughs> there's three of them. Yeah, two years ago. From two years ago. So I know some of the things that... Okay, there's a flaw to this plan. No one gave me an audio cable. Um, I know one of the... So there was that cancer thing that they studied? I mean, the, the AIDS thing, um, where they got the people to solve it in 15 years. There's also now a, a crowd-sharing math thing, where all they do is, here's a couple hundred-year-old math problem no one's ever solved. And they actually organize them in a more structured way, so it's not just your random professor mentions this problem and you might come across it. It's now organized into categories of topics, so if you're really good at this stuff in your math field, and they're starting to solve problems that have been unsolved in like 200 years, just because no one's ever looked at it in 200 years, because it's gotten lost of time. So that's another good thing with crowdsourcing, is it's better at getting the right question to the right people. Another advantage of these techniques. And also, they raise awareness. Um, one of the biggest things with Globe at Night, instead of it just being, come analyze data for us, collect data for us, it creates It creates a community of people who are out there doing observations, recruiting other people to help them with their observations. And it's not just now about data collection or about data processing. It's now also about community involvement and educating people, spreading the word, especially with the Dark Sky Association. Most people don't even think about it. Most people, when you talk about community lighting, are more worried about safety. They don't even think about the concept of polluting the night sky, making it so we can't see things, or now they're starting to study the health side effects of living in a city with lots of lights. There's actually now studies like with shift workers and other people who are often exposed to light at crazy hours and sleep studies, and the damaging side effects of health. And this is now linked to that, and they've studied these things and found these things because of these kinds of programs. Things they probably wouldn't have found before because there's like 10 people interested in that particular field. But you get hundreds of people observing, and then it spreads to thousands. Last year they had 18,000 people making observations for Globe Night. That really spreads the awareness, and now we're starting to get dark sky cities, all these kinds of things. Did you see that documentary from a few years ago about the, uh, the lack of, the lack of uh, dark skies? And um, a city dark? I think it was, yeah. Yeah, uh, I like the documentary. That was a good one. So that's the dark is a documentary about like pollution. It doesn't just go and say, oh look, we can't see this guy anymore. They actually go and talk about the health side effects on people. And one of the most sad scenes in the whole movie, everybody in the theater was tearing up when I saw this. Where these turtles, when they hatch, they typically float towards the water. They, and how they find the water is the moon is reflecting off of it, so it should be the brightest thing. But if they hatch near a city, They'll crawl towards the city instead, and they don't make it to the water, and then they die. And everybody's like, the turtles, help the turtles. So at the end, like my favorite part of the movie, is the last part of that scene is a little note saying, we put all the turtles in the water after filming this. Because they're all crawling towards the city, towards their death, instead of towards the water. What was the name of that documentary? A City Dark. A City Dark. It used to be on Netflix, but I think it's not there anymore. Now you have to go to their website. I have some clips. I show that in my astronomy class. Do you have clips that would show perhaps more than one locality? Or are the clips only near like one? For the little bit night here? For, for a shiny um, When you click on their website, it figures out like a little pop up on your computer or your phone will say, can we use your location? And they make sure that this map matches where you are and the viewing conditions for your area. They, they pick different constellations for southern hemisphere observers and northern hemisphere observers. 
and they try to customize the angle to what you're probably looking at. And there's also apps now which are amazing. You just like, it tells you what constellation you're looking at. I was making my students download it. It used to be in like a, a physics class, I'd make people do a lot of math problems and analyze this, and analyze that, and they have no connection to the real world. Now I make them install apps on their cell phone and do this kind of stuff, and now they're getting that science connection to their everyday lives. Yes, they might not get the math they need to become a scientist, but at the community college level, intro level classes, I think this is a better use of their time. So this is the kind of stuff I make my students do. Do you remember the name of the app that uh, you can find the constellations? It used to be Google Sky. Google sold it. I think it's just called like Sky now. And it depends if it's Android or iPhone. There's an iPhone version, it's like $2. The Android version was free for a while. I haven't updated that on this phone in so long. It still says Google Sky. But I, I know that they sold it. It gives you so much free adware along the sides that it makes it almost impossible to actually see if what you're trying to download is going to work. Yeah, sometimes you got to get, um, let this, see so I can find the logo. Make sure I get the right one. I kind of want an Elmo. I can just show you guys what my screen is. So yeah, um, if you guys are ever doing outreach or stuff, oh here it is. It is just called SkyMap still if you're on an Android.
It looks kind of like the Milky Way, but a little dimmer. In the sky, if you get into very dark conditions. Hmm. You cannot see that here, even under ideal conditions. Sadly. I love Michigan for many reasons. The sky is not one of them. But this kind of mapping, I've changed screen for me. But this kind of mapping is how you can help to identify where it's good to go, what's not. Like uh, St. Patrick's Day, there was aurora. In theory, you could have seen them here. But nobody did because the sky was too bright. Because our city is too bright. I know some people who went out on Lake Michigan on boats and they could see the aurora. It was even a green aurora, very appropriate for the Patrick's Day, right? There was a movement uh, like 10 years ago, I remember, where lighting fixtures outside were, they were trying to put caps on them so that the light would only shine down. I hope it's still going. Yeah. So that's part of what the International Dark Sky Association, who helps sponsor the Open Night, does, is they try to educate people. They don't want you to not put lights on outside, because they do want you to be safe. But just point them to where they need. Save your energy. Point them exactly on the walkway, not up into the sky. Like those cotton ball lights, I call them, that just... They don't actually point down, because the post is in the way. They only point up. <laughs> so they're pretty much only useful for blinding people and not actually useful for making you safer. Those are the worst, worst light pollution things I've ever seen. The other speaker went over. I'm going under. <laughs> what, what about the light that's reflected off of pavement, though? Is that a problem? Yes and no. It's more diffuse, and it's not as direct. So it takes more, it helps with the general background, and it's not like a weird point source. And um, a lot of light pollution cities, you replace them with the sodium lights instead of with generic fluorescent lights. So the light is in a very specific wavelength, and they know and they can filter that out. So it's not just less light, it's also only light in very specific wavelengths. Do LEDs, light bulbs, help with that as well? It really depends. There's so much variation in light bulb and in LEDs now. But the, the, the gas ones, it's the emission of the, so it's very specific. Mm -hmm. Seems like the new, the new lights that are on I-94 in the Detroit area, those are LEDs, and they're, they seem very directional, so which is probably a good thing. They do at least have caps, but yes, when I was flying in last week from far away, you could tell the difference between the white pavement and the blacktop and how much they reflect. And you, can, and you can see the areas that have covered lights that don't have covered lights. That's dramatically different from the plane. Next time you're flying at night, look out the window. You can tell the cities that are well lit and the ones that aren't. The ones that aren't well, look, well lit look prettier from the plane, but they also have their, their downsides. Like Las Vegas. Is so do you know any other apps that geeks might be interested in? Oh, there's so, so many. Um, there's the Foldit and uh, the star mapping, the genes in space is kind of a new fun one. Can you fly your spaceship? And it tricks you. There's some classification ones. Um, Moon Zoo, I think, is moving to. Why is it so hard to read backwards and type backwards? So this is just a basic search on my cell phone app, and I have an older phone so that I only get old apps. I test phones at work all day, so my personal phone is like the oldest, crappiest, cheapest one. So all of these, uh, this one helps with like, they tell you when certain ecology things are happening and if you can go to this event and get that. Um, this one is related to Moon Zoo and astronomical events. There's also a really fun orbital dynamics one. So. Whenever you hear, like, there's an asteroid that's going to get this close to the Earth, oh no! Usually we're fine. The hard part about that is, if it gets that close to the Earth, the mass problem to solve its orbit is actually an, it's an insolvable problem. You can only approximate the solutions. And when it gets that close, those approximations get worse. So the real problem with those is figuring out what's going to happen next. And these dynamical interactions, that's the interesting thing. And I'll have way more of that in my next but I'll, I'll say this, so I will go under time for that too. Where um, you play with these orbital interactions and it helps them to test us all. Are these asteroids going to hit us? Or aren't they? 
or there's really cool ones. Um, so the technique for discovering asteroids is to just take a lot of sky pictures. And because asteroids are closer to us than the stars, they move differently in the picture. So the stars all look like they're stationary. And the dot for the asteroid will move across that picture. But with things like stray uh, sightings of other random dots in the picture because of bad photography or bad CCDs, computers have a lot of false positives on that. So there's another app where you can look at this data and go, yes, that's a, a, an object moving through, or no, that's a random spurious line or plane or a satellite. And if you, get, if you look at them long enough, you can tell the difference almost instantly so with our eye. But the computer just sees a dot and goes, oh, it's a detection, yay. So that's another fun app I like. And that's just looking and clicking, and you can get a lot done pretty quickly. Well, what's your other talk? So you're doing Beyond, uh, so I think it's in the little thing, it's just called Solar System Objects. Hmm. Um, it, like last year I did a joint one with uh, Bob Tremblay, did a lot of other talks. I mean, he, he has a lot of great stuff, but our techniques are very different. And we had like three hour talk and like a one hour time slot. We never actually got to the stuff past the asteroids. So I'm going to now just focus on like the centaurs, the KBOs, Kevin stuff, where all those other minor planets are. And at the, a couple of years ago, we knew so little about that. But now we're sending spacecraft there. And New Horizons is almost to Pluto. I've only been waiting since high school. <laughs> It makes me feel really old that my students in my freshman college class are, have no memory of when New Horizons launched. It makes me feel old. So have you ever played with the uh, Kerbal Space Program game? No, have you? I, I've looked at it briefly, but I did, the machine, I, the laptop I had wasn't up for it. But That's I've heard of the whole blowing up a lot of spaceships on the platform. Yes. Has anybody else done any interesting space and science games? Study at home? I've never actually done a study at home. I, I feel like a speaker. I used to work for study at home. I know we can talk about this, and I've never actually downloaded it. I did study at home back when it first came out. Me too. Yeah. So, did you know about the, the God user who they got fired? I, I think I remember hearing about that one. Well, there's a couple people who apparently study made a, a special screensaver just for the people who have been fired by uh, <laughs> using their program at work. So, so don't use your computer resources from work to do these things. What? Except your cell phone. My cell phone from work, I'm, I'm being really loud for personal <laughs> reasons. Well, that's what I ran was the screensaver because then you could have the full control of your computer when you're actually using it. Yes. Um, and the newer computers are a lot better at prioritizing and keeping the study stuff at a low priority so it never interferes with anything. Some of the older computers can't tell the difference and run everything at the same priority. Mm -hmm. So like your important stuff doesn't happen when it should because you're too busy running studies. Okay, now I'm actually supposed to be done, so. Thank you for coming.